All right, we'll start. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us this evening or afternoon or morning, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so this is another drop-in event from the Free Speech Champions Project. And the title of it is Defending Truth from Trolls and Cancellors in Conversation with Jonathan Rausch. And Free Speech Champions, the project aims to inspire the next generation about the importance of free speech and open inquiry. And hosting tonight's event is myself, Anaya Filar and Iman, as well as Daniel Sharp, who is a writer and free speech champion at the project. He's a recent graduate at the University of Edinburgh and is arts and books correspondent at ARIO magazine. So before we get stuck in, just a few house rules. This event tonight is about an hour and 15 minutes long. And we'll first have a discussion between the co-hosts and, and, and Jonathan for the first half an hour to 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Please feel free to um, chat and exchange ideas in the chat function. But if you do want to ask a question, um, please use the raise hand function. And we're at the time of the Q&A section, then we will pick people um, one by one. And please turn your video on. We always want to see the people that are at these events. And it's really good just to, um, in, in replacement of our in-person events temporarily, for us to at least have some more experience of seeing who's there. And also the Free Speech Champion Project is run by donations, large and small. So please consider giving a donation. It goes a huge way and makes a big difference in terms of organizing around free speech, particularly amongst young people. So without further ado, I will now introduce our guest speaker, Jonathan Rausch, who is an author, senior fellow in the Governance Studies program at the Brookings Institute and contributing writer at The Atlantic. And in his 1993 book, Kindly Inquisitors, The New Attacks on Free Thought, Jonathan sounded an early warning of the threats to free speech from fundamentalism and the now ubiquitous claim of offence. And in his new book, The Constitution of Knowledge, A Defense of Truth, he argues that the enemies of free thinking now take different forms, but they are no less dangerous. So I guess the first thing that I want to ask you, Jonathan, for people that may not necessarily be familiar with your work, um, they may be wondering what this idea of the constitution of knowledge actually means. It sounds like quite an academic term, some might even say opaque. Could you really, in, in layman's terms, describe to us what the constitution of knowledge means? Not the first to say it's opaque. It's, it was quite a decision for me and the publishers <laughs> to go with the title. Um, but I, first, I want to thank you all for coming. It's, it's wonderful to see you. I, I think I recognize a few friends here. I certainly see Helen. Uh, and it's very kind of free speech champions to have me. I'm so supportive of what you all are doing. And I'd also like to know what Daniel is drinking. Uh, pour myself <laughs> a glass of that. A nice Chianti. So every society, <laughs> a nice Chianti. Very good. It's only 2.30 here, so it's not quite drinking time yet. Every society, whether it's a large nation or a small tribe or a religious sect, has to come up with some way of figuring out what's true and what's not true, at least for public purposes. You know, a lot of people think Elvis Presley is still alive. Do we send him a pension check, a government pension? And what do we decide about religion, about politics? These are things that have torn societies apart in the past. And usually, historically speaking, for the first 200,000 or so years of human history, the way a society decided what was true for public purposes was essentially divide into different sects with different leaders and different cults and holy books and priests and potentates. Um, go down their rabbit holes, become ignorant, dogmatic, go to war with each other. A lot of people get killed. Um, knowledge is not advanced and peace is not preserved. So about 300 years ago or so, some people come along, many of the same people who work to create other kinds of liberalism. Uh, our US constitution, the parliamentary system in the UK, uh, the capitalist economy, and said, well, let's do it a different way. Instead of having rulers decide what's true and what's false, let's have rules. Let's set up what we now call a social network, though they didn't have that term at, at that point, of people checking each other's ideas, looking for errors. Let's force people to persuade each other in order to make knowledge. Let's require everyone to do experiments and make arguments that anyone else could make so that everyone all over the, the world in principle can be on the same page. These become the rules that give us the reality-based community 
that's the pillars of that are, are science and research in academia, number one. Number two is journalism. Number three is law. And number four is government. All are basically fact-based, reality-seeking institutions. We depend on all of them to keep us from going to war over truth and to make us knowledgeable. They're under really kind of an extraordinary attack, several different kinds of attacks, one from the left, one from the right today. And that's what my book is about. I won't, I won't filibuster the whole time, but there's, there's a lot there to unpack. Awesome. Um, well, yeah, I mean, um, I suppose then we should briefly talk about what those threats are, the threats you identify. Um, I think you, in the, in the book, you, you talk a lot about internet culture, uh, what that's done to us as a society for good and for ill, um, and the threats from disinformation and trolling uh, flood the zone with shit, as one uh, book chapter is delightfully called, in a quotation from Stephen Bannon, um, and cancel culture. So if you could talk about, yeah, um, what are those threats, um, and what, how exactly do they undermine the, this idea of a social network, a social process, of knowledge production. So the constitution of knowledge relies heavily on trust because of course we can't know everything. So we submit ideas to complete strangers across the world to be checked. Um, we can't always know if people are cheating, if they're acting in good faith. So it requires a lot of trust and good faith. It requires a lot of institutions. This is not a system of individuals talking to other individuals. One of the big mottos of my book is it's not a marketplace of ideas. It's the constitution of knowledge. Most of the things that we publish, for example, in journalism or in academia, um, the kinds of work that lawyers do, these are all funneled through institutions that force people to compare their ideas and pick and select and then move it elsewhere in the network. So you need a lot of trust and you need a lot of institutions. So what if you want to destroy that trust and, and damage those institutions? The book talks about what I think are the two biggest threats right now, of which one is in the US significantly bigger than the other. One is chaos and the other is conformism. The chaos threat is from people using now Russian style disinformation tactics and propaganda tactics, adapting them and deploying them in American politics. And here I'm talking about, yes, I know this will sound partisan. I have voted for many Republicans. I am center right. But what I'm saying now, I think, is not ideological. I think it's, it's just the case. We now have the takeover of a major political party by um, the propaganda machine. That has never happened before in American politics. The Stop the Steal campaign was only the latest in a long series of what, um, what's called the, the fire hose of falsehood propaganda tactic that was perfected by the Russians and then adapted by Trump to the US. Um, but it's the biggest and most audacious and most successful disinformation attack ever waged against Americans by anybody, domestic or foreign. As a population, we are naive to it in both the sense that we never thought it could happen here, we're unprepared, and also in the epidemiological sense. We have no defenses against this kind of attack. We never experienced it. We never thought it could happen. Uh, that's going on right now, and it's convinced 75% of Republicans that the rightful president is Donald Trump. Um, it's corroding the very core of our democracy, and if Trump and the Republicans were to get back in power, they would do even more of it. The other problem is, is canceling. Uh, coercion, the use of social coercion to essentially punish people who get out of line as seen by usually fairly actually small factions of activists, often radicalized activists, who have discovered that they don't really need government censorship if they can complain to your employer on social media, make you controversial, make you radioactive, you can be fired from your job the next day, you can lose your friends the next day, your reputation will be demolished because anyone who Googles you will see that you're, I don't know, a racist, a rapist, you name it. Um, they'll go after your friends so that you'll be ostracized. Your professional connections can dry up. All of these are very powerful tools of enforcing social conformity and that too is a form of information warfare. It's manipulating the environment 
to intimidate and silence people for political advantage. So both of those are going on in America right now. And they both, unfortunately, they've, they've both been quite successful. Jonathan, could you just, to put this into context, elaborate on what these institutions are and what their role is in society. So in your introduction, you kind of mentioned, um, you know, journalism and academia. Why are those institutions important and what, func what function do they serve? So, for example, you know, now we hear people talking about the, the point of university is to um, essentially protect the feelings of vulnerable students. W what is the point in university? What, what function does it serve? Similar with journalism and other political institutions so we can understand kind of what exactly is being attacked. Yes, thank you. That's so important. So the common feature of the institutions and rules of the reality-based community, in other words, of the constitution of knowledge, is that they organize large networks of people and institutions in a collective search for error. And that's different from what humanity has done until the last few hundred years. People thought they knew it was true and they just established it, usually, often by force, sometimes by persuasion. This system sets up these vast institutions in many, many numbers around the world and puts them all to work to develop intellectual standards and protocols so that we can compare ideas in a systematic way, acquire them into this network. You know, I have a hypothesis, I submit it to a journal. The journal then, if it's interesting, usually often it's not, but if it's interesting, we'll acquire it. It'll then publish it, but also peer review it. It'll parcel out pieces, which will go out to the network. Sociologists may look at one part. Political scientists may look at another. Same thing in journalism. When we publish stories, we, we go to newsrooms. I'm a journalist. I grew up in this environment. You're going to have to persuade editors. You're going to have to pass through fact checking. And then you'll see if other journalists pick it up. They may debunk it. You may have to run a correction. So all of these institutions are about acquiring ideas and comparing them, forcing them to be compared with other ideas in a systematic way. And, and that's super important in AYA because at least in the US, we have this notion, if you ask people where truth comes from, they'll say, well, it's a marketplace of ideas as if free speech is enough. Well, free speech is essential. As you know, I've spent my career fighting for it, but it's not enough. Because if you just leave people to sort of disaggregated peer-to-peer -peer conversations, they tend to look for ideas that confirm their biases, associate with people who share the same biases, go down epistemic rabbit holes, get into sects, go to war. That's human history. What's new here is these institutions and rules that say you can't do that. The only way you can make knowledge is to submit your ideas to this rigorous often international product of checking by all these institutions that are going to engage all of these other people and trying to shoot you down. This is not fun. It often causes, it often causes offense. A no offense society is a no knowledge society. It is a no learning society. So in practice, what are we talking about? Universities, think tanks like Brookings, research institutions like our National Institutes of Health, courts of law, academic journals, uh, newspaper journals, the legal institutions are a critical element of the uh, fact-seeking community, as Donald Trump found out when he tried to take his frivolous factual claims to court about the election. Uh, the, the whole notion of a fact actually originated in law, not in science, because you needed this common version of events and adversarial processes to find facts in order to have law. And then the fourth big pillar of this community is government. And that's everything from in the US, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which makes the weather reports, one of which Trump simply lied about, he simply changed, all the way to places like the Congressional Budget Office and the intelligence community, which is also fact-seeking. So we're talking about a network of thousands of institutions and millions, hundreds of millions of minds all over the world engaged in a constant search for error. That's what we're talking about. And, and Jonathan, when, when you talk about the threats to those institutions, you know, the thing that comes to mind is, is it a kind of chicken or the or an egg? Because some people would argue that it's been the decline and the corruption of those institutions that has led to um, the kind of 
ex the attacks and the extremism that we're seeing? Or are you arguing that the extremism and the attacks have come first, and then that's led to the decline of those institutions? Would, or, or would you say, which one do you think is coming first? Well, they're happening simultaneously, so it's, it's hard to know. Um, we have seen some worrisome trends inside the reality-based community. Uh, we see some of those in academia. Again, my experience is more in the US than the UK, but I think there's evidence that similar things are happening in the UK. Problems include, for example, in many fields, in, um, in, in, in a number of disciplines in many universities, the near absence of conservative or center-right viewpoints. So that's bad for the social environment because it tends to impose conformity, but it's also very bad for science because we can't see our own biases. We don't see our own errors. We have to have different biases pitted against our own. That's where knowledge comes from. It's it, the key ingredient here is viewpoint diversity. We're seeing a shortage of that. We're also seeing the use of manipulation by activists initially in universities and then off campus that we're using tools of social coercion, like demanding the investigation of professors who were critical of received orthodoxy among certain factions on campus. And now we see this off campus. We see now the progressives are by no means immune to this. They're frequently coming under attack from counselors. Um, so we see both activists who are beating on the system challenging the rules, but we also see within the system some worrisome decline in the kind of diversity that it needs to do its job. So it's, it's both. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on, uh, you said, you know, free speech is necessary, but it's not sufficient. But um, since we're the free speech champions, uh, we should talk a little bit about that more specifically. What role does does free speech have in, in the constitution of knowledge as you see it? What, what, what is its importance in, in that scheme of things? From a political point of view, it ensures that no single authority can simply commandeer the whole debate. Uh, as typically happened in most human societies until free speech came along, you would have a prince or a priest or a potent or politburo, you know, beginning with P, it would say, here's what the truth is. This is unchallengeable. And if you challenge it, you'll lose your head or your position in society um, or spend a long time in prison. Free speech says you can't do that. You can't just end the argument. You might, no matter how certain you are that you're right, you might be wrong. And that twit out there with a strange point of view just might be right. So from a knowledge point of view, you've got to have free speech to have the, the raw material from which knowledge comes, the new ideas the challenges to old ideas. Um, so free speech is essential, both epistemically, if you want knowledge, and politically, if you want freedom. It's also essential to minorities like me. You know, I am a homosexual American. I was born in 1960 in a world where people like me were, were deep underground. We could not work for the government. We were fired from our jobs frequently. If we were discovered, we were considered a threat to children. We were reviled from the pulpits. Psychiatry regarded us as sick. Probably most of you know that the greatest single hero of World War II may have been Alan Turing, who because of his homosexuality was subjected by the British government to a barbaric practice known as chemical castration. That's the world I grew up in. And now I am married now for 11 years to a man, and that is entirely because of free speech. That is because people like me were able to raise our voices and challenge the bad and oppressive ideas that were around us. So free speech is also essential if you care about moral progress and minority rights. Yeah, well, I think I was going to add, um, I mean, that, that's one of the, the things about the idea of free speech nowadays is that it's often you know, commandeered by I don't know, people like Miley Yiannopoulos and some other unsavory characters and it's often seen as some kind of reactionary right-wing talking point and I think for young people and particularly students uh, that is perhaps what turns them off about it uh, whereas yeah, I think yeah. that people it, that you it, it breaks my heart yeah, yeah. It, it breaks my heart so many people not just young people so many people are just completely unaware of where civil rights came from uh, Frederick Douglass 
used to say that I won't quote this exactly, but I'll get the sentiment right, which is that if free speech prevailed in the American South, this is in the 1850s before the Civil War, free speech had prevailed in the American South, then the shackles of slavery would fall off within five years. The South engaged in massive sense intimidation campaigns to make sure that the voices of abolitionists could not be heard. Mm. In my time, there was tremendous energy dedicated to keeping people like me in the closet so that we were too, too afraid to speak out. Um, this is true of all minorities. John Lewis, the great civil rights advocate who died only about a year ago, famously said, without the freedom to defend, uh, without free speech and the freedom to dissent, the civil rights movement would have been a bird without wings. But so many people just take these freedoms and this moral progress for granted that, that they don't recognize that, that this could only be won because of the moral obstinacy of some people who started out with some very unpopular ideas about equality. And I was one of those people. And, and what we were fighting for, for what's now called LGBTQ plus rights, we called it gay rights back in the day. We were not just fighting for our own freedoms. We were fighting for everyone's freedoms, for everyone to be able to live as who they really are to the maximum extent allowable within other people having the same rights. Um, we were not trying to turn the table so that instead of our being silenced, we would silence others. That's the last thing that we should be in, involved in. And, and Jonathan, when, when you talk about the constitution of knowledge, and you mentioned the evolution of institutions to create this quite complex network of knowledge production. Um, uh, it, it makes me think, what role does the kind of unfiltered, the unregulated expression of free speech come in? Because all of this is, whilst obviously it's fundamental, um, a lot of it seems to be filtered through all of these institutions of experts almost, a kind of technocratic form of free speech, especially since you're very cr critical of, of, of Trump. I mean, do, do you, what, what role do you think for kind of a, a populist expression of free speech that's not filtered, that's not regulated, that's not mediated through all of these institutions? Do you feel like there's a place for that type of free speech? Oh, oh sure. So the way I think of it, Inaya, is as a kind of social funnel. And at the big end of the funnel, you've got free speech, and that's all kinds of ideas, propositions, hypotheses, claims, surfacing all the time. Now, the nature of the world is that 99.999% of them will be false. It's very, very hard to find new knowledge, but you need all of that outpouring in order to be able to sift through it and find the grains of gold. So that's the big end of the funnel. That's free speech, and it's the raw material, and it's why you don't want to shut people up. They may be right. As H.L. Mencken once said, that every important new truth was initially greeted by society as if it were a new wave of smallpox. Um, I can attest to that because gay marriage was such a crazy idea from out in the wilderness that my own father told me in the 90s to stay away from it because it would destroy my reputation. So some of that crazy stuff out there, it might be right. So that's the big end of the funnel. But then all of that goes into this process that I talked about earlier, this network of it's like pumps and filters. They acquire these ideas, they look at them, they winnow them down. Only the small precious few that really hold up to a lot of different kinds of testing by a lot of different kinds of people with different biases emerge from the end of this, the narrow end of this funnel and make it into the textbooks as knowledge. And that's a very long and difficult and rigorous process that's mostly done by professionals. So we have freedom of speech, it's crucial. We don't have freedom of knowledge in the sense that if you wanna get something in the textbooks, it's not enough to just mean it's true. You're going to have to show it through and that's the kind of winnowing process that is keeping out the rampant conspiracy theories right now about the 2020 election in the United States. It is those professionals and experts, the lawyers, and the judges looking at these conspiracy theories and saying, nope, nope, checked it, not true. So those people are essential if you want knowledge. And, and, and what role do you think social media plays in that? Because there's obviously different schools of thought within the free speech advocate perspective. Some people think that social media companies and, and uh, should completely stay out of uh, speech 
uh, regulation and all of these types of things, where some, some free speech advocates essentially say that it's an imperative on these social media companies in order to protect the public, the digital public sphere, to actually intervene. Where do you stand on that argument? Well, in between, social media is challenging because it's not just one thing. If you take Facebook, it's, it's really, it's four things. Let's see if I can remember them all. But of course, it's a platform. It's a place people go to express themselves. But it is also a community, which means it has community standards of things people should and shouldn't do, terms of service. It's also a business, which means it needs to make money which means it needs to have a product that people actually want. And it's also a publisher, which means that it's soliciting and aggregating content, bundling it, presenting it to audiences, and then selling those audiences to advertisers. That's exactly what we did at the Winston-Salem Journal when I was a reporter. Um, if you don't think Facebook's a publisher, ask Facebook, because in court depositions, they have said they're a publisher. So it's all of those things. Well, one of those things, platform, implies very little regulation of speech, only if it's illegal. But the other three imply a great deal of regulation of speech because you wanna have community standards, you wanna have a viable business. If you're a publisher, you need to take some responsibility for what goes in there. So they're walking this tightrope between these conflicting imperatives. Um, here's what I think the answer is not. Simple, plain old, anything goes completely unadjusted free speech. And the reason for that is Facebook has never had that. Twitter has never had that. They have always used algorithms to decide what to place in front of people. A flaw in those algorithms have been that they're completely neutral as to what's being said is true or false. Um, it turns out that creates an environment where fake stuff, which is much cheaper to produce and much more fun to read, circulates significantly faster than true stuff. So you wind up with a system that's actually biased against truth. So in the opposite of what the reality-based community that I described earlier is doing, which is trying to find the true stuff and amplify it. it. Doesn't throw anyone in jail, it just says the good stuff gets amplified. On social media right now, the tendency is for the bad stuff to get amplified. I don't think the solution is going to be censorship, so to speak, in social media, because I don't think it will work. Um, but I think what they are looking for and rightly looking for is better algorithms that will do a better job of amplifying stuff that isn't fake, better ways of detecting inauthentic behavior and actors, and better product design, which encourages we who use social media to use it in pro-social ways, to not, for example, retweet bogus stuff just because we think it's funny. Um, the Facebook Oversight Board is an example of doing what's worked in the past when we've had earlier epistemic crises and disruptions. Um, like the reform of 19th century journalism in the US, which has begun to develop some standards, some rules of the road, try to do that transparently. And if they work, if they make the environment a better place for the users, place that's more congenial to truth and to pro-social behavior, then other social media may adapt and adopt them. And you'll see the development of some rules and norms that will bring these institutions into the constitutional knowledge. Now that's, that's the hope. It's anything but a guarantee. Uh, I think um, perhaps when we get onto the audience questions, there might be some interesting things about that because it's something I'm divided on myself, the, the idea of Twitter and Facebook being the regulators of speech on their platforms because those platforms have become such a, a kind of public square almost. And it's... Yeah, the, it's monopoly, the monopoly issue is tough because, you know, until Facebook, and well, it's really Facebook is the big one. Twitter is kind of a monopoly, but it's also pretty small um, compared to Facebook. But, but until now, we could count on diversity. They're, one of the great things about the system, the, the reality-based community, is that there's, there's no gatekeeper. There's billions of pathways through these networks of checkers. And if you don't get into one journal, you can try another journal. And if one experiment doesn't work, you try another experiment. Or someone else from a completely different country says, you know, I think I know a better way to prove that hypothesis. So there's all kinds of pathways through it. But any given node through the pathway, it's more likely to, to pass along good information than bad information. And that's kind of brilliant when you think about it, because you don't need somebody saying yes or no 
in a definitive way to any given idea. And online, preferably, we would have the same thing. There would be 10 or 20 Facebooks, so that if one had rules that weren't working, people would gravitate toward one that is working. The big problem that we have is not to do with free speech per se, it's to do with the monopoly or near monopoly status of, of Facebook and some of these other platforms. There just simply aren't enough other places to go. And that is a real dilemma for which I do not have, unfortunately, a real solution. But before we go out to the audience, I just have one more question for you, Jonathan. That, well, there's one thing that I just worry about that you seem to be arguing that the solution is fundamentally a kind of bureaucratic, institutional and technological solution, rather than what seems to be, at least from my, my understanding, a kind of cultural and political one, which is the fact that we've seen the rise in you know, extremism on the right is you know, to do with a sense of not being represented, a sense of alienation, um, a, a sense of being locked out of the democratic debate or on the left, uh, an unhappiness with the way that society is being organized, social inequality. Like, uh, I, I worry that your, your solutions are more technological and bureaucratic rather than what other people might argue, which is a, a kind of political and cultural problem, which is being manifested in a lot of this, these, um, institutional corruption and, and trolling and cancel culture? Well, it's, it's both and. Um, and that's the argument that try, the book tries to make. And it's, it's a little complicated, um, but, but the constitution of knowledge like the US constitution is a partnership of professionals and ordinary people. Um, I call it the constitution of knowledge for a reason. It's doing the same basic thing the US constitution is doing, which is setting up systems that force people to cooperate in order to get things done. So that's compromise in the US constitution and it's persuasion in the epistemic constitution, but they both heavily rely on professionals. We don't have direct democracy in the US or any other major democracy, it wouldn't be practical. We elect people, professionals, who we delegate to make these decisions and then we put them into contest with each other, checks and balances. And we have a whole suite of institutions like the courts it creates standards and incentives to keep them in line. So it's a huge professional establishment, but, but the founding fathers of America, all of them, all of them warned us, none of that works if the people themselves don't exhibit what they call civic virtues. And that's things like being an educated voter, voting, being willing to accept the defeat. If you lose an election, you accept that the government that comes in is legitimate, even if it's not your first choice, um, being truthful, not lying too much. Um, the same is true in the constitution of knowledge. You, you've got to have the professionals. Those are the people who created the vaccine that's protecting me right now. But you've also got to have a society that is culturally and politically friendly to the constitution of knowledge, that respects it. Sometimes, you know, I may be a scientific creationist, but I don't in the textbooks because my side lost that argument. Not the end of the world, I can still believe it, I can still say it, but it's not going to be in the textbooks. So you have to be willing to lose some arguments and move on. You have to be willing to let other people criticize you, even if it's offensive, even if it's emotionally, in some cases, very hurtful, because that's where knowledge comes from. We try to soften that in all kinds of ways. But so there, there are also these epistemic virtues that ordinary people need to have. So it's, it's, it's got to be both. Um, it's, it's got to be, as the US Constitution says, not only enshrined in law, but in the hearts of the people. Is that responsive to where you were going? No, absolutely. No, really compelling, thank you. Okay, we're gonna open it up to the audience. Um, so please, if you have a question, raise your hand okay got lots of questions already all right so we're gonna firstly go to izzy let me um, you can unmute yourself izzy can you hear me yes all right, thanks for your fascinating talk. Um, 
I did, I just finished my master's in philosophy of science um, and for my, um, I, and I did research into um, the lack of viewpoint diversity in the social sciences. Mm. Um, and I'm sure you're familiar with um, the 2015 paper by um, Duarte and others, Jonathan Haidt, um, political diversity will improve social psychology or something like that. Um, so I did my research on that and was quite disturbed by, by what I discovered. Um, that in large areas of the social sciences, there is almost this um, um, this lack of, of, of the self-correction we usually take science to have. Um, and I find it personally disturbing for two reasons. Firstly, in epistemology, we talk about a principle of, of, of deference to experts. So obviously we, we all have limited capacity. We can't um, discover the truth on every aspect ourselves. So we can listen to experts. Um, and what but, but what do you do when when you can't trust the experts? The experts are meant to be the academics, the sociologists, the social scientists. What is the layperson meant to do when you can't trust them? And secondly, you know, we, we we I think since, since the Enlightenment, we used to think of academia as a sacred institution of knowledge production. How what what happens when there's large-scale rot in, in, in areas of, of, of academia, how, how can we bring back academia to being more rigorous and truth-seeking? Uh, I'd love to see your research. Is, is it available? Oh. Is he's muted? Yeah. Unmute yourself, Izzy. Um, all right, I haven't published anything yet. Um, I can send you the the, the essay um, an email. I'll, I'll get you email from the event organizers. But I, I, I'm in the process of writing a blog for Hetero, he, um, Heterodox Academy um, about it. Yeah, well, I'm a big fan of, of HXA, as, as you can imagine, and very influenced by their work. Yes, please send me your research. And am I, from what you say, I assume that you found that in certain disciplines, there's very little, even maybe shockingly little viewpoint diversity. Yeah, there's um, in some, in, yeah, you have um, some universities where in their social science department, we have upwards of 90% self-identified uh, liberals or, or leftists and, and conservatives um, um, report um, having both overt and covert discrimination against them. There's a big new report out by Eric Kaufman, who I think is, is it University of London? Um, uh, Birkbeck, yeah. Um, which is finding pretty disturbing levels of, of out and out discrimination in academia against people with conservative viewpoints. And also disturbingly, it along with other research finds that conservatives are just as happy to discriminate, but since there hardly are any of them, they're not in a position to do it. So these are violations of the spirit of the constitution of knowledge, where we're supposed to welcome viewpoint diversity. We're supposed to understand that without viewpoint diversity, diversity we cannot make knowledge knowledge would not exist viewpoint diversity is the raw material of the system we cannot see our own biases so the descent of university disciplines and departments into kind of a mono tribalism is as we said earlier first it's bad for science and second it's bad for the social environment the good news is that i think we're starting to see more academics becoming aware of it um, we're seeing academics, including progressive academics, who are worrying about it. We're seeing increasing documentation of the distortions that this is causing in disciplines like sociology and political science, questions that are not getting asked. Um, surveys that, uh, that don't take on board conservative points of view. The hardest part about this is, Ian, you know, you're a bit younger than I am, so it's up to your generation to solve this problem. So here's what I'll put to you. You can't just open the door and conservatives flood into sociology tomorrow because there's so few in the pipeline. We've had so many years of self-selection out of by conservatives in these fields that you all, almost kind of have to go back to the beginning of the pipeline and, and start making an effort to have viewpoint diversity. So how do you do that? Well, number one, uh, we talk ad infinitum in universities, and outside of universities about inclusion and diversity. That should include viewpoint inclusion and diversity. Doesn't mean that you can screen academics based on who they voted for, 
but it means you have to make every possible effort to stop discriminating against conservatives. Root that out. You need a commitment from the universities and their faculties to make viewpoint diversity a co-equal priority with other kinds of diversity. And you have to mean what you say. And that means you also have to go and start trying to recruit in your graduate programs and your scholarships and your incentives. You have to start going to conservative communities. The people, the activists on campus may not want even to have there. You have to start going to those communities and recruiting, making sure you know that you're open to them, making them feel welcome when they get to campus, making sure that they don't get intimidated and harassed and investigated over time. I think all of that can make a difference but it's hard. And another point you made is he is exactly right. The public is, at least in the US, losing confidence in academia because it has figured out that in a lot of academia, you've got these you know, overwhelmingly left-wing points of view. Uh, we've seen in the last five years, a 20 percentage point drop in public belief that universities are good for the country. Most of that is from conservatives. And it turns out this is a little dispiriting most of that is based on an underestimate by conservatives of how few conservatives there are on campus. In other words, if they knew the facts that you're finding in your research, they would be even more disgruntled with universities. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to take a few questions. Uh, here at some point, I'd, if we have time at some point, I'd be curious to hear what Helen Pluckrose has to say about all this, but I, I won't push you to the front of the queue, Helen. <laughs> Um, we'll take a few questions at a time because we're... Yeah, I'll try to be shorter too. I'm... No, no, it's fine. <laughs> um, so, Dylan? Hi. Uh, thanks again for coming, Jonathan. My pleasure. Um, so, earlier you were talking about how um, it was moral obstinacy that is kind of the stuff of free speech and the stuff of liberty. But um, it seems to me that right now that there's almost an overabundance of moral obstinacy and that that is part of the reason why people are suspicious of claims for free speech coming from the right. And it's why people are sort of suspicious of the tactics that are being used on the left as well. And so I wonder, how do you cultivate the right amount of moral obstinacy? That is such a beautifully phrased and profound question. Um, another reason I call the book The Constitution of Knowledge is that our greatest thinker on this question is James Madison. And this was the core problem that he faced in framing the US Constitution, which you'll remember was born out of a period of chaos when the, the original states could not govern themselves. On the one hand, he said, you've got political ambition and that's what drives us forward in politics. But what do you do about overweening ambition which then tries to take over the system? He realizes that there's only one force that's capable of containing ambition and Dylan, you know what that is. I'll put you on the spot. According to Madison, what is the only force that can contain ambition? I want to guess humility, but as a like civic virtue, as a extension. A good guess. A good guess. The answer is ambition. He says in the Federalist, we must pit ambition against ambition. That's what checks and balances do. That means that any ambitious person has to deal with other ambitious people who want other things. And the result of that social forced social negotiation, imposed social negotiation is political order. This is pure genius. It is an extraordinary dynamic insight. You can't say enough about what a space alien James Madison was to come up with this at the right moment of history. So science, liberal science, the whole thing, the constitution of knowledge, journalism, all of it, faces the same problem, which is you want people to enter that system with very strong viewpoints. That's the raw material that drives science forward. Stubbornness, belief that I've got it right. You've got to, you know, to establish new knowledge can take an entire career. And that requires real dedication and sometimes real stubbornness. On the other hand, you have to have a system 
which corrects people's errors and recognizes their errors and encourages them to admit it when they're wrong. So this seems like just an impossible pair of demands. You know, you, you, which one do you want? Do you want the humility or do you want the obstinacy? How do you get both? Well, it's Madison's solution. You take people with strong but different points of view on what's true and you force them into managed negotiation and conflict so that they must appeal to lots of other people say, here's why I'm right, here's why the other person is wrong. And at the end, I will abide by the results even if I disagree with the results. So there are cases in the book from geology of 200 years ago and modern cases from, and, um, from paleontology of these absolute wars that rage within even the hard sciences between these factions that are just fighting tooth and nail, cannot agree. And how the process eventually resolves this with other actors who come in from the outside and say, you're both partly right, but add a hypothesis or they resolve it by discovering new evidence. But it's the impetus of their obstinacy plus their willingness to observe the rules of conflict, the rules of engagement. That's the magic solution that makes the constitution of knowledge unique. With all other systems, it's only the obstinacy or it's only the conflict. So we'll take um, three questions next, then you'll, you can come back, Jonathan. So we'll, we'll take Ewan, Daniel Palmer, then Sophie. So Ewan, do you wanna go first? Hi, um, my question was, um, in your book, you talked about uh, when you were a campaigner for same-sex marriage and the people generally, even when confronted with knowledge that they would agree with, wouldn't change their mind on the issue unless either someone in their life um, was affected by the issue or someone they respected uh, publicly changed their mind on the issue. I'm wondering if you could... Um, if, if there's any similarities between uh, changing people's minds on that point and changing people's minds on the extremes of being more resistant to free speech. So um, if one of the ways for people to um, start being more tolerant to free speech is, to, is for someone that has a lot of respect and that is in a camp that is resistant to free speech to change their mind publicly. Um, David? Yeah, I'm just going to, something that was alluded to earlier, um, Jonathan, which is, I'm going to be a bit critical of you here, yeah, is, um, you know, okay, markets, market place of ideas, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient for establishing knowledge. And you have laid out both in this book and your previous book, um, that essentially we need institutions and rules that we, they've said all this just now, that we check each other's biases, no one has got final authority, no one gets final say, no, no view is banned or excluded. Now, surely what you say, your example of where you think progress is being made is with these oversight boards um, for Facebook and other uh, big tech uh, social media monopolies and uh, you know the multiplicity of fact checkers that they employ. Now there is extensive evidence that you know there's enormous political bias in you know I don't need to go over everything but there's been enormous political bias in the way big tech uh, uh, social media has behaved over uh, over the you know over lockdowns over for example the uh, uh, the Democrats' behaviour after two thousand and six you know the so called uh, steel dossier which was clearly you know a uh, misinformation um, not saying we know how Trump behaves but nevertheless it's it's also on the other side of the political spectrum now surely you're proposing I mean you did indicate the monopolistic nature. Of big tech, which is a major problem, surely uh, leaving it in their hands, where it's very centralised, where it's very top down, where it's very uh, self interested, it's very politically part of that partisan, isn't going to be a solution, right? That there's got to be some other solutions to the problem, given their track record so far. 
uh, I'll give you a chance to respond to those two, Jonathan, because they're two quite big questions. All right. I will do my best. I'll try to keep it a little shorter because I see other hands in the queue. Um, Ewan, I think I heard two different though related questions packed together. I think one question was how do you change minds about facts in general because people are very stubborn where we, um, we cling to our, our ideas of how the world is. It's part of our identity actually. And the other question is how do you change minds about free speech as an issue? And those are two different questions. Uh, changing mind about facts is very hard. A lot of people will never do it at all. But what we seem to know is that as the old saying goes, you can't make people agree with you, but you can make them want to agree with you. So if you've got an uncle who believes in stop the steal and some kind of vast conspiracy of Democrats to kidnap and, and murder babies and drink their blood um, and, uh, and all of that, then what seems to work best is to ask a lot of questions, to approach in a spirit of curiosity, to, to try to get them to walk through what they believe, to say, you know, ask questions like, so if there were such a conspiracy, how would it be hidden? What are the names of the people who are doing it? Why would they do that? If you wanted to steal the election, uh, you'd require thousands of people. How is Trump buying these judges who he appointed? What is he paying them on? And so forth. And, and do this in a spirit of, of of curiosity and see if they can be drawn toward a more rational attitude. But direct confrontation with fact checkers rarely does it in the case of individuals. Um, how to change minds about free speech? Well, I'm doing it the best I can. Um, something I say constantly when I talk about this issue is that freedom of speech, the idea that, I, that, that speech, which is heretical, blast from a seditious, um, immoral, bigoted, offensive, or simply wrong, that that should be not only allowed, uh, but protected by the government, is the single most crazy sounding counterintuitive social idea of all time, bar none. It's saved only by the fact that it is also the single most successful social idea of all time, bar none. It's how we get freedom, peace, and knowledge right there. But the result of its counterintuitiveness means that the people like me and people like you, you look a generation or two younger and your children and their children will just have to get up every morning through the end of time and explain the rationale for free speech from scratch. And you know what? We just need to be cheerful about that because we're doing incredibly well actually compared to where our ancestors were. And so that's why I write books like this. It's why I speak in colleges. And it's why, above all, I try to explain to people my history, the history of gay rights and minority rights, because right now, that's the point that people aren't getting. They think somehow free speech is a conservative conspiracy against minority groups, when the opposite, the absolute opposite is true. So I think that's how we do it. Your job is going to be to continue to chip away at that. Uh, but we're doing great, actually. Um, so David. Um, tech can't self-regulate given its track record. So in earlier times when we've seen earlier disruptions, it turned out that becoming a swamp of misinformation was bad for business in 19th century journalism, for example. Um, it was a race to the bottom for eyeballs. It was hyper-partisan, uh, full of fake news, um, kind of what we see today for some of the same reasons, perverse incentives. This was remedied because it was not a sustainable business model. People, it turns out, really hate being in a distorted, um, polluted information environment. So what journalism did is it created the American Society of Newspaper Editors. First thing it did was in the 1920s, it promulgated rules now that we take for granted, but things like be accurate, run corrections, check your facts and how to do that. It then instantiated that through journalism schools, which began training people to, in the professional ideals of journalism, it created awards like the Pulitzer Prize in America, ironically named after one of the yellow journalism print barons. Um, but they realized they had a problem and it was building these norms and institutions over a generation or two that got us actually to where journalism was remarkably truth-based on the whole. 
So a question, another way of asking the question is, can that happen again? And can that be done without heavy handed government regulation? Um, I'm against heavy handed government regulation because no one's proposed anything that looks remotely plausible and because Donald Trump might be president again in 2025 and I don't wanna give him control over social media. So I think the question you ask is the right question. Can these industries and their engineers and their audiences work together to find better ways of doing stuff online, create an environment that is less toxic? I think they can. Um, I'm not sure that they will. Thank you, Jonathan. So we'll take a few again, because you've got lots. Um, Sophie, then Phoebe, then Helen. Great. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Um, I should say first of all that I found I, I find the idea of the constitution of knowledge and everything like profoundly appealing. So that's the place I'm coming from. Um, and as I understand it, it's essentially this idea that different we need diversity of viewpoints. We need no one viewpoint to kind of force out the others. We always need this kind of social process of questioning and refining rather than any one kind of single top-down imposed objective truth but in order I to wish i had said that as well <laughs> um, magnificent but, thank you um but in order to kind of protect that social process we need what you call the the rules of engagement or the rules of conflict um and so as i understand it it's kind of the institutions of liberal democracy that that make up those you know those checks and balances that we're talking about um, so I guess my question is kind of rooted in the idea that, you know, as, as a, a massive proponent and supporter of liberal democracy, nevertheless, liberal democracy has its own vulnerabilities built in. I mean, you can only argue against freedom of speech because you, we have freedom of speech. Um, there's kind of, there's always going to be, I mean, we've had these, these incredible institutions um, that have developed over the last few years or last few centuries rather that um, a lot of them have become kind of ideologically captured and they've, they've been very vulnerable, um, perhaps because of the, the freedom and the checks and balances that are built into them. Um, so I guess my question is a practical one about if we have to now almost start again and build up those institutions and protect them, how do we change them? How do we kind of come up with checks and balances and rules of conflict that make them less vulnerable to ideological capture or is there just a way of doing that is it just a kind of endless fight um helen i i was just um thinking about about sophie's um question and how th how that fits in and i think uh, john has mentioned several times now that um a lot of of people here are younger and i'm hearing from a lot of people who are feeling quite fatalistic about the current state of affairs and and how are we ever going to get past this and I, I think that he makes, um, John makes a very good point when you say it, looking at this in historical sense, we are in what feels like quite an existential state of emergency right now. But we have been in this um, on and off um, forever. And those of us who, who are older, I mean, we, we have seen the fall of genocidal communism, of Nazism, of fascism. We have seen over the last few years so many advances for women, racial, sexual um, minorities. I think we are still in a good place for this. I believe from what I'm hearing that this liberal mindset is the strongest overall. But what we're hearing so much at the moment, I, I think this, this media issue is the current problem that we're gonna have to, to, to negotiate. Now, I'm, I'm still only part way through your book, Jonathan, because I'm, I'm reading it alongside um, Robin D'Angelo's Nice Racism. I'm using you to kind of wash my brain in between chapters of that. So I'm not sure how you, um, address this idea that that we are going to keep needing to teach every generation 
about why it's so important that we um, take on all ideas, that we address all ideas, that we don't censor all ideas. I don't know of a way to, to kind of ingrain this in the human psyche because it just seems so, so counterintuitive. So is there, is there a, a way in, the, I, so I won't keep going on, but um, when we had the old style media, it was almost as though we had philosopher kings because we had only the selected elites who could argue with each other. Now that we have social media, we have a plebiscite and we're seeing the tribalism um, in real time. And I, I'm not sure, I, I know the problem is, is with human reasoning and not with the technology itself, but yeah, how to how to overcome that, how to restore some kind of, of sense of, of hope and that we have beaten bad ideas before and we will beat them again. And Phoebe, then we'll go back to Jonathan. Hi, thanks for coming. It was a great talk. Um, I was just gonna ask, you say that like nobody has a final say um, and that we must always have a free marketplace of ideas, but then how do we ever actually reach objective truth? Or are you saying that we're always reaching for that? Um, can it ever really like be decided on? And also who decides on what objective truth is? Um, like what is a true or untrue idea? From my side of things, um, you know, I would say that a woman is an adult human female, a lesbian is a female homosexual, and I've been um, I regard those things to be nouns um, and I regard those things to be objective truths but then I'm also sympathetic to the idea that objective truth is sometimes difficult to completely decide upon we've had you know the Chilcot inquiry with the media we've had um, all the lies around the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq um, how are we supposed to trust our institutions to tell the truth about things and you know should we automatically just believe somebody that you know Oceania has always been at war with East Asia you know, how, how are we supposed to differentiate between what is actually some nutter online who's spouting a conspiracy theorist that like Clinton's got babies in the closet and is drinking their blood and stuff and somebody who's actually raising quite valid concerns around um, government and media and ultimately as well pharmaceutical corruption. I, I think some people would say that it's a conspiracy theory to believe that a pharmaceutical business that makes billions of pounds cares for us is you know all caring and wants to cure us um how do we differentiate between um actually dangerous ideas which are fundamentally untrue and um those which are actually quite valid and people just use the phrase conspiracy theorists to shut them down that's what i've got to say yeah um if i can add before we go back to jonathan a relevant um story about that i mean you've all heard of the um uh, the COVID lab leak theory and there was a story in Newsweek uh, a month or two ago about this this basically this, this bunch of amateur internet sleuths who managed to uncover evidence that maybe maybe that theory wasn't a conspiracy theory maybe it wasn't totally insane and it was after they had uncovered it that the more institutional the more mainstream scientists began to say well okay uh, we're not entirely convinced but we can't rule it out whereas you know previously to that, they had been pretty, pretty uh, dead set against it. So, yeah, that's just relevant to this sort of in, this idea of institutions, conspiracy theories, who decides what, um, and it's, it's well, it's never easy. So, those, the three points that Sophie, Helen, and Phoebe made, in some ways, overlap, and I'm hearing two themes. Um, so without doing complete justice to any of the three of you, because you're asking big and deep questions, I'll see if I can say something about those themes. One is the theme of how do we keep the system regulated and on the level um, so that we can trust it? You know, it is a vast system. Um, there, are, there are millions and millions of minds involved and in institutions all over the world. Um, but often, as we do see in academia, we can see um, one-sidedness creep in, uh, often unnoticed. So how do we keep them upright? How do, we, uh, how do we prevent corruption? So that's question number one. Question number two is about fatalism. So I'll get to that in a minute. 
So in terms of preventing this corruption, I think the starting point is diversity. Um, this is the other great point of Madison's genius. In a republic, he's very worried that some one faction will take control. He, he thinks it's going to be a majority faction, but it turns out it could be a minority faction as well. So how do you prevent that from happening? His answer is, he says, extend the sphere. He has another point of genius, something Madison, he is a space alien. He says, increase the sphere of the republic so that you're always bringing in additional factions and interests, and they will disrupt the existing relationships of the existing factions and others will come to them as new allies. They will introduce new ideas and new political dynamics, and that will keep the system from falling into the hands of any one faction. I think the same is true in the Republic of Science, that the starting point for staying honest is to make sure that we welcome diverse viewpoints and to make sure that each of us, no matter how sure we are that we're right about race or class or whatever it is, abortion, you name it, gun control, policing, that there is someone in the system who is saying something different from what we're saying, even if we hate to hear it. If you have enough diversity in the system, and if those voices are able to be introduced into the system, that provides in most cases over time, not immediately, of course, because you know, often in the short range, people with unorthodox ideas are, are just dismissed. Um, but as Daniel said, over time, as people look at it, as they reach deadlocks, dead ends, blind alleys, they'll reach out to these other ideas, or they'll come to them and say, hmm, maybe they're onto something. We've seen that again and again throughout history, and I lived it in gay rights. Um, it was being heard that brought the diversity that debunked all the, essentially, can I say this crap that I grew up with. So diversity is where I would start if you're looking for balance and honesty and integrity. Um, Helen's point about fatalism and I, I also, you know, I, I heard some notes of that in Phoebe as well. So it's also complicated. How do we sort it out? And social media is such a difficult challenge. And, um, you know, a marketplace of ideas is fine, but how do we know that the truer ideas will, even in the long term, rise to the top? I mean, you know, in markets, garbage can persist for a long time. Uh, one answer to that is, well, good ideas prevail over bad ideas over time, and that's the standard answer that people give. I think that's an inadequate answer. I think that in order to understand the answer to that question, you need to understand how these actual institutions work that are doing the job every day, professionals and institutions, and sometimes amateur, of weighing and valuing these ideas. They may come in the door looking like conspiracy theories, but they may find something valuable in there that needs to be looked at. That's what happened with the lab leak hypothesis. By the way, those were mainstream journalists who kept after it. People at the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times kept on top of that story. So the system can self-correct if you have enough diversity in there. And in terms of the fatalism, Helen, I hear you. Right now, the other side seems 10 feet tall. They seem to be They've got, you know, social media seems to be untamable. Um, wokeness or critical race theory or postmodernism or whatever you want to call it seems to be just marching through the institutions. It's got the academy, people say. It's now got newsrooms. It increasingly has boardrooms and human, um, human resources departments and companies. Um, and then disinformation between Putin and Trump and some other people. Fantastically rampant. It looks like a terrible moment and it is a bad moment. It just simply is. But here's what I try to remind people of. I've talked a lot. I've alluded to disinformation and propaganda. What I mean by that is organizing and manipulating the social and media environments to disorient, um, disrupt and ultimately demoralize the other side. If you're on campus, you want them to think, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to express my unorthodox point of view on affirmative action or race because I'll just get hammered. No one will come to my aid. The whole system's against me. I'll just stay silent. In disinformation, what you're trying to do if you're a Russian or if you're Trump is to flood the zone with so much garbage, as Steve Bannon said, flood the zone with so much shit that the media can't keep up with it. What's the point of even trying? No one believes us when we listen to it. The public throws up their hands. 
can't make head or tail of it. I don't know what's true or false. I can't tell what run, who won the election. The reason all of these factions want so much to demoralize us is that demoralization, epistemic demoralization is political demobilization. We stay home, we lose faith, we think we can't change it. So the way we're feeling right now, and I don't exclude myself, where it just looks so hopeless, that's the state that they are trying to induce. That's the win for them. The way we fight that is by refusing to give in to the fatalism. In fact, we have some enormous advantages in the constitution of knowledge. Advantage number one is that we are the only system that can put an end to creed wars and put a vaccine in my arm in less than a year. The trolls and the cancelers, they're completely parasitic. They're nihilistic. They cannot make knowledge. They can't make anything. All they can do is tear down and free ride. A second huge advantage is this spectacular institutional depth built up over 300 years. The Royal Society, the very first academic society, Isaac Newton was the chair of it. It is still there, still doing its work. These are profound, there, there is still deep reserves of integrity in these institutions. If we can rally to them, if we can regain the confidence to defend the values that they stand for, and those are the values of diversity, uh, the rules of the constitution of knowledge. And the third big advantage we have, maybe the biggest of all, is reality itself. This goes to maybe what Phoebe was saying earlier. Um, sure, there's garbage out there. There's conspiracy theories. The system over time is really pretty good when you put it through all of these filters and pumps and nodes. It's really pretty good at finding reality and identifying what's actually true. No other system can do that. And in fact, a constant problem for propagandists, disinformation artists in places like the Soviet Union and East Germany was that they themselves lost the ability to tell truth from fiction. They're so busy fooling other people, they wind up getting absorbed in this themselves. We see this now in the Republican party in the US, which is losing the ability to even distinguish true from false claims about the election. It can no longer do that. That's a terrible disadvantage for them. Ultimately having reality on, on your side is a good ally. So look, I'm not saying be complacent, this all comes out, go home, deep sigh of relief. I am not saying that. What I am saying is that we're in the stage of combat, which is like, you remember, was it 2011 or 2012? It seemed like ISIS in Iraq was just invulnerable, sweeping across the country. Well, they weren't invulnerable. They seem that way because they had surprise on their side. Something like that has happened now. Social media, brand new. The cancelers and trolls were much better, much faster to see its potential than the liberals were. Donald Trump came out of nowhere, applied Russian style disinformation to a naive population, came out of nowhere. Canceling in academia, online, and these new ideologies, not entirely new as Helen will tell you, but these ideologies that seem to sweep out of nowhere, we were unprepared. Our side, the liberal side, the side that's for pluralism and diversity, I'll say my side, I suppose, is only now beginning to organize and fight back. Helen's group counterweight is one small part of that, but it is starting to organize and fight back. If we organize, if we fight back, if we are not fatalistic, if we develop confidence in our ideas and our ability to solve problems and bring peace and create knowledge, then I think in the long run, maybe the medium run, we squash them like a bug but that's conditioned on our doing the work. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, really compelling um, closing statements. I mean, do, do you think you have time for, for a couple more questions? If not, it, it's fine. <laughs> Up to you, yeah, we can do one more round. I have to leave in about five or seven minutes. Okay. I apologize so for that. No, that's fine. We'll, we'll take one more round and then you can just pick up on whatever you want and then we'll we'll um, close the event for tonight. So we'll take just three more questions. Sorry, we won't be able to get to everyone. Um, Alka, Shankar, and then William Mathesi. Alka, um, you can go first. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, John. Very, very compelling. And I agree with... Um, an awful lot of what you're saying about the constitution of knowledge. My one niggle <laughs> is the description of the naive public um, prone to the machinations of media, whether it's Putin or Trump or whoever, 
because I don't, and it's to do with, it's to do with, um, I think, the way you pose a relationship between knowledge and politics, because I'm not sure that people come make the same decisions and judgments according to the same standards in political life as you would when you're in the realm of knowledge making, if you like. So it seems so. It seems to me you couldn't, you know, when you sort of stack up, Trump has this percentage of truthful facts, Clinton has this percentage of truthful facts, and Trump has more lies. Why have the public voted for him? It seems to me there are there are different ways you can go with that fact, but the way you will go isn't necessarily itself an outcome of knowledge. If you see what I mean, you can interpret that. It comes back to the question of interpretation and to what extent interpretation is. Is not is an outcome of knowledge because is it that the public are naive or do we go with um, well maybe Clinton um, Clinton may have all the facts but there's something very important missing from that argument and I would say that what was missing from that argument was the ability to go beyond just the factual and to go to a kind of a broader Im imaginative realm of being able to look at different positions and come to a that wider understanding that you need for the consensus that you described so well. It seems to me that doesn't just depend- Thank you. It's not an argument to be won by facts. It needs it, something more imaginative, something more flexible. Um, Thank you. And Sh Shankar, very, very quickly, please. I'm used to up. Yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll try and keep this brief. Um, so yeah, this is more of a clarification than anything. But obviously, as you mentioned a while back, there seem to be two main approaches to tackling this sort of era of misinformation, which is the sort of campaign of hearts and minds, which we've been talking about a lot, and the technocratic approach, uh, more bureaucratic kind. Um, do you consider one to be the driver of the other? You know, is there one route we should focus on first with the hope that the second route follows next? Or, you know, perhaps one that's simply easier to implement? Um, that's basically all I wanted to ask. Thanks. And then 10 seconds, William, very quickly, please. Uh, sorry to say, I, it's, it could take too long to ask. So I'll stand down, sorry. All right. Jonathan, do you want to pick up on anything? Just summarize your key points. Sure, uh, I can. I think I can deal with these fairly quickly. Um, the first is that I completely agree with Alka. There's a lot going on in politics. It's politics is not a science. It is not. Its goal is not to establish knowledge. Uh, its goal is to select leaders, but it does need to be embedded in a climate that is um, respectful of facts. You, a democracy will not last long if 70% of a political party believe completely falsely that an election was stolen and are now busy um, making the standard for getting into office as a Republican, the promise that they will not allow this to happen again. In other words, that they will uh, put their thumbs on the scale of election. Uh, that is not sustainable in democracy. So you do need, you don't need, um, democratic politics to be truth seeking, but you do need it to be truth friendly. And that's the respect in which the epistemic constitutions and the political constitutions rely on each other. You, you do need both. Um, Shankar, is there one thing you do first? I think the answer to that is no. This book is hard to explain, as you've heard, because there's so many moving parts. But the hardest thing to talk about is that I concluded there isn't just, you know, the short list of the few bullet points that really make a difference. Uh, well, I can think of one bullet point. This will sound partisan. It's not. I think it's, I'm, I'm center right. I voted for many Republicans. I think one thing that clearly helps usually is keep Donald Trump out of office. Um, I think if he and his party were back in power, controlled Congress in the White House, we would see even more of the kind of massive disinformation tactics that, that have worked so well for them in the past. So that's a big one. The map I tell people is what's in all kinds of society mobilization. And it's everything from civic organizations like Talents Group that are finding ways to push back against illiberalism in the culture to journalistic organizations, which are getting much smarter about handling disinformation, did far better in 2020 than they did in 2016 in those two election cycles. The Academy is becoming much better about studying, understanding disinformation. There are watchdog groups and nonprofits that are going inside the disinformation networks. 
giving early warning to social media companies and sometimes law enforcement and journalism of the campaigns that are coming. Um, we're seeing um, the social media companies themselves are starting to make changes. They're behind the curve, but I'm encouraged by social media's oversight board. That's the type of thing that historically has worked. I think the big changes there that will succeed are not in policy changes, though. They're ultimately they're in platform changes. They're going to be in product designs and changing the incentives so that people can use these things in ways that are more friendly to, to truth and, and less toxic. And I could go on and on in this vein. Um, the point is it's it's a lot of adjustments across a lot of society to these changes in technology and in politics and in ideology. It's not any one thing. And it's each of us and our institutions, whatever that institution may be, doing what we can in our institution to start nailing down uh, the points on which we're lacking on the constitution of knowledge. So if we're in academia, if we're a university president, recommit to free speech. Sign the Chicago principles. If you're on a faculty of an anthropology department at a liberal arts college, start asking awkward questions about why isn't there a conservative around here? Um, if you're a student and you're feeling chilled on campus, you're not speaking out, maybe it's time for you to speak out if, if you're a conservative. If you can start a group and start pushing back as, as Helen has done and as many others are doing, you can do that. All of us can do something in our spheres. And if all of us do do something in our spheres, then yeah, I think we squash them like a bug. Thank you so much for speaking at this evening's event. Really compelling, really fascinating. And I think everyone will agree that there's lots to chew on and hopefully people have been inspired to do their little bit. Um, so thank you so much, Jonathan. <laughs> I won't take any more. Well, and, and thank you to Free Speech Champions for the work that you're doing. Amazing. If you are a young person or student and want to stand up for free speech, yes. join Free Speech Champions and also buy Jonathan's book, The Constitution of Knowledge. Yes. So, the book you. is better than the movie, people. <laughs> <laughs> right. Good to see you all. Thank you very Thank you much. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you. Bye, everybody.